coming out of that stuff. The largemouth bass, one of North America's most sought-after game fish. And I might add, one of my favorite fish. You know, I like largemouth bass fishing for a wide, wide variety of reasons. Hey, let's face it, it's fun to get away from it all. Get out on the water on a beautiful day like this, a little escape, yet it's challenging at the same time. Largemouth bass are available to everybody. The fact of the matter is there's probably some great largemouth bass fishing close to where you're sitting right now, and in many cases, it's a bypass fishery. Talk about adaptability. Largemouth bass can be caught in shallow water like this. They can be caught on flats. They can be caught in deep water. They can be caught suspended. That's one of the reasons why they're so challenging. It takes a versatile approach to consistently catch largemouth bass. The fact of the matter is once you learn how to catch largemouth bass and apply the versatility principles that are essential to it, it'll make you a better fisherman for every species of fish you fish for. You know, versatility is really the key to bass fishing success. A simple understanding that not one lure in one location will always produce largemouth bass. By watching this series, we're going to show you where to go, but more importantly, you're going to know when to go there, and you're going to know what lures to use when you get there. You're going to have a better understanding of bass fishing because you're going to be catching more fish more consistently, and more importantly, you're going to know why. The Mastery Series is designed to help you become a better angler in four ways. You'll be learning the basic principles of bass fishing in natural lakes. It'll be a system of knowledge, not just isolated facts and tips. You'll be training yourself to look with an expert's eye, noticing little details in the environment that are essential for catching bass. You'll be developing the skills and techniques you need to catch more bass more consistently. You'll learn how to integrate your knowledge, senses, and skills into strategies. Plans for fishing effectively and efficiently. This mastery series is not just about catching fish. It's about learning how to fish. That's important, because no matter how good you are, there's always more to learn. Hey, you know, along with the ability of catching fish like this consistently, comes a sense of responsibility. Ugh. That's right responsibility. You know, I believe in catch and release. I practice it a lot. And I believe you should, too. Hey, I'm not saying take every bass you catch and put them all back. There's nothing wrong with keeping a few fish for the table now and then, but definitely learn to take some of your fish and release them. It helps ensure the future of quality fishing for all of us. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to the In Fisherman Mastery System of Catching Bass. Welcome to the Bass Mastery Lab. You know, out on a lake, there can be a lot of distractions. The beauty of nature, the excitement of fishing. That's why during this series, we'll be coming back to the lab to illustrate key points. Here we can show you things that you just couldn't see out on a lake. Like what a lake would look like if you drained it. A detailed lake map, so you can get the picture of what's happening in a lake as a whole. With our computer, we can show you any view of the lake. And we can even show you how bass are using cover during different seasons at different depths. In our equipment closet, we've got the rod and reel combinations that are necessary, along with a full assortment 
of all of the major families of bass lures. You know, in this series, we'll be using the in-fisherman mastery system of organized fishing knowledge. That's location, behavior, and presentation. Location means being able to find the fish. You need to know the locations that a natural lake offers. You have to know when groups of active fish are probably using those locations, and you need to know the small spots within a location that the bass are most likely using. Behavior means being able to take advantage of, or at least cope with the fish's basic nature. You have to know why the fish are using the location and how the fish respond to changing conditions. Presentation means being able to select a lure that's just right for the location you're trying to fish and matches the behavior of the fish in that location. Presentation includes other essential skills, like reading a depth finder, handling a boat, casting accurately, and choosing the right equipment. As you improve your skills in all three areas, finding the right locations, understanding how the fish are behaving, and making the right presentations, you're going to be catching a lot more fish and having more fun doing it. However, if you neglect any of these areas, you could get frustrated. Oh, sure, you're going to be catching a few more fish, but not as many fish as you should be catching. Okay, I know what you're wondering. Al, just how many more fish am I going to be catching? Well, the fact of the matter is, in fishing, there is no guarantees. Hey, there's days I go out on water and don't catch anything. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. There's a lot of tournaments won by pros who spend a lot of hours for two pound and a half fish. Again, the point is, in fishing, there is no guarantees. I think the real value of this series is what we mentioned earlier, learning to catch fish. I can't make you a better fisherman, but by applying the material in this mastery series, you can make yourself one heck of a better angler. In this chapter, Al will help you understand one of the basic principles of location. Bass will be abundant in a lake only when specific locations meet their basic needs. By knowing the key locations that meet those needs, you'll be able to find good spots for bass fishing. Largemouth bass have simple needs. They need food, mostly smaller fish, crayfish, and large insects. They need cover, a hiding place from which to ambush their food. Their metabolism needs relatively warm water for good growth rates, temperatures that don't go much higher than 80 degrees, but stay above 50 degrees for a good part of the year. They also need good spawning areas, and they need locations that are not dominated by competitors, like a northern pike or a muskie. A lake that meets all those needs is going to be a good bass lake. The most important thing to remember is the bass won't be all over the lake. They're going to be in key locations. Locations where conditions are best for survival and growth. In almost all lakes, these conditions are the same, no matter where you go. How do you find these conditions? A good place to start is a lake map. This is Little Lake X, a gem of a lake that only exists on paper. We put Little Lake X together to illustrate the key location areas that you can expect in any good bass lake. The hardest part about fishing is that the fish are underwater. In most cases, you can't directly see where they're at. I've got to be able to use my mind's eye. I've got to visualize what this lake would look like if it didn't have any water in it. To help us do this, we built this model of Little Lake X. We also took a slice through Little Lake X and made this cross-section diagram to show you what the fish will be doing at different depths. Right now, let's take a look at all of these views and see the key locations that bass will be using in a natural lake. Like most good bass lakes, Little Lake X has a lot of shallow water, water that is less than about eight feet deep. The best shallow water locations for bass in lakes tend to be shallow weed-filled bays, channels, and reed beds. Shallow bays, especially those with lily pads and thick weeds, provide cover and food for young bass and groups of large older bass. Sheltered bays often hold good spawning areas for bass. Channels are one man-made feature that can actually improve the bass fishing in a lake. The shallow water warms up quickly in the spring, and channels often provide excellent spawning areas. Reed beds provide good cover for bass through most of the season. Moving out from shallow water, we come to the location in Little Lake X known as the flats. The flats include water that is about 5 to 10 feet deep. But the flats are really defined by the cover that grows in that depth of water. On most lakes, plants grow up to or just below the surface, providing a lush habitat for bass and the smaller fish they feed on. The outer limit of the flats usually has a distinct edge called the weed line. 
Water clarity determines how deep light will penetrate and how far out into the lake the flats go. On very clear lakes, cover will grow up from as deep as 12 to 15 feet. Where the water is less clear, the weed line may only be eight feet deep. And where the water is dark and stained, there may not be any weed line at all. Points are a key location for bass, especially where the cover on the flats also comes to a point. The structure of a point creates an environment that attracts groups of bass and provides excellent fishing. Sunken islands are another structural feature in a lake that attracts bass. Sunken islands are usually important only when the top of the island is shallow enough for cover to grow on it, forming a weed line around the island. The deeper water is an important feature that makes Little Lake X a good bass lake. But on most natural lakes, bass tend to use only the deeper water just off the weed line, down to about 20 to 25 feet. And when bass use deep water, they tend to concentrate in locations where the bottom slopes steeply away from the weed line. This kind of location, known as the drop-off, break line, breaks, and so on, holds groups of bass at almost any time of year. A lake map is a good place to start, but it doesn't show all the good spots. The fact is, some of the best locations on a lake won't be on a map. The contours are simply too wide to pick up those key defined areas that attract most of the bass. When I fish a lake for the first time, I always map it out myself. Using my depth finder, I follow the weed line or first drop off all around the lake. Then I crisscross the lake in a checkerboard pattern to check out the deep water. When I'm running the weed line, I'm always making mental notes. Here's a sharp drop off with good cover on top. Here's a little inside corner, a little point that normally wouldn't show on a map. Here's an area that has no cover, drops off quick, it's not worth my time. Here's a major structural element, in this case a big point. It drops off quick here, a slow taper here. Got a bunch of fish suspended off of this corner. I continue along the drop off, another little point here, another structural element that's big, follow it all the way around to where I started. Then I'd go up in the shallow water to see what the cover looks like here. Then I'd come out in the main lake and kind of zigzag across it, almost like a checkerboard effect. That's how you find these deep, subtle humps like this that normally wouldn't show up on a map. Hey, I highly recommend taking the time to do this. Believe me, it's worth the effort. It's the best way I know to get a mental picture of what the lake bottom looks like. In this chapter, we've shown you the key bass locations in a natural lake. Shallow bays, channels, reed beds, flats, points, sunken islands, deeper water, and drop-offs. In the next chapter, we'll show you how some locations hold more bass than others during different seasons of the year. In this chapter, Al will cover one of the most important basic principles of bass fishing, the annual cycle of movement. This principle describes how bass use different locations in the lake at different times of the year. Any natural temperate zone lake goes through tremendous seasonal changes as it warms up in spring, reaches a peak in summer, and then cools down in fall and winter. This cycle of seasonal changes determines where the bass will be located in a lake. It also affects their behavior. So to be a successful angler, I have to understand how the seasons affect largemouth bass. To deal with seasonal changes, we develop the in-fisherman calendar of fish activity. It works for all game fish in natural lakes. In this case, we're talking about largemouth bass. Our calendar with certain lake conditions. Because our calendar is natural, the dates of each period will change from lake to lake and from year to year. The calendar helps me interpret what I observe on a lake. Water temperature, growth of cover in a lake. These are natural signs. All those things give us clues about where the bass will be located and how we should fish for them. Let's work our way around the calendar. The pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn periods happen in spring of the year. Water temperature and the need to reproduce have the greatest effect on a bass. In the pre-spawn period, the warming waters of spring bring the bass out of their deep, cold water haunts. As shallow water temperatures warm up to the high 40s and low 50s, small groups of bass begin to cruise into the shallow water. Often they go back to deeper water if the temperatures don't remain stable. As temperatures reach the mid and upper 50s and stay there, significant numbers of bass enter and remain in shallow water. Protected shallow bays warm up early in the season. 
Bays on the north end of the lake warm up faster than those on the south end because they receive more exposure to the sun. Dark organic material on the bottom absorbs the sun's energy. A black bottom bay will warm faster than a light colored bottom. Man-made channels also warm up quickly because they are sheltered and isolated from the main body of the lake. Not all shallow water is good for bass. Narrow bands of shallow water, like those adjacent to the main body of the lake, do not warm up quickly, and they do not retain their heat, so they are not attractive to most bass in the pre-spawn period. This diagram shows where the most active bass are in the lake. The general trend of activity during pre-spawn is out of the cold, deeper water into the shallow, warming waters of the lake. During pre-spawn, not all the bass in the lake are shallow, only the most active bass. During the spawn period, water temperature reaches the right level for egg laying and hatching. The male bass builds a nest by sweeping away loose organic material to expose a hard bottom. After the female lays her eggs and leaves, the male protects the eggs and fry from predators. Then the male scatters the fry away from the nest. Most groups of bass in a lake begin to spawn when the water temperature reaches the low to mid 60s. Because of genetic variability in the bass population, some will spawn at lower temperatures, and a few groups will wait for higher temperatures. Bass will try to spawn in whatever locations are available, but certain types of shallow are best for spawning. Where the lake bottom is sandy, covered with a thin layer of dark sediment, many bass can successfully build their nests. Where the bottom is deep muck or the sediment is too thick, fewer bass will successfully build their nests. In pre-spawn, the bass were drawn to any warm, shallow water. During the spawn period, they concentrate more in shallow water where the bottom is best for nest building. In post-spawn, both male and female bass will be recovering from the effort of spawning. Bass are starting to relate to the cover emerging in the lake. The post-spawn period covers a range of water temperatures from the mid to upper 60s. Early in the post-spawn period, some bass may still be spawning in the shallow water. A few bass may even still be waiting to spawn, but most bass will be starting to move to locations throughout the lake. The fish were concentrated in the pre-spawn and spawn periods. Now groups of bass are beginning to disperse, following the emergence of good cover throughout the lake. Bass are using cover in shallow water, flats, and deeper water. It is a period of roving and instability, with fish in one spot today and gone tomorrow. Keep this in mind. In one lake, there can be groups of bass in all three calendar periods. That genetic variability protects the overall population in case bad weather wipes out the eggs of one group of spawners. We highly recommend leaving the spawning bass alone in all lakes and focus on a pre-spawn and post-spawn bass. The first three periods showed a tremendous range of changes from very low water temperatures to very high water temperatures, from very little weed growth to a lot of weed growth. The next three periods, pre-summer, summer peak, and summer, offer a time of stability and growth. It's a time of good, consistent fishing, spiced with days of tough, challenging conditions. In the pre-summer period, you can see that the cover has really come up, almost to the surface on some flats. Weeds and lily pads fill the shallow bays. Water temperature in the main body of the lake is now in the upper 60s. Groups of bass have followed the growth of cover, and now they are located at all depths, down to the deeper water at the drop-offs. This dispersal throughout the lake is the start of a general summer pattern for bass. Some larger, older bass in the shallows, some larger bass in deeper water, with the majority of the population in the flats most of the time. But keep in mind that groups of bass are still roving, looking for the best locations from day to day. You must be ready and able to search for them in the pre-summer period. The summer peak is a short period when the lake explodes with activity. Plants reach their maximum growth for the year. Major insect hatches occur. The lake is full of life. This period usually occurs when water temperature in the main lake hits about 70 degrees. In summer peak, there is a tremendous increase in fish activity along the outer edges of weed lines, drawing bass from the shallow and deeper water. 
When cover reaches its peak growth, groups of bass tend to settle down and remain in specific locations. Summer patterns are now established, but they can be disrupted by day-to-day -day changes in the weather. During the summer period, human pressure becomes an important factor on many lakes. Thick weed growth can make some shallow water almost unfishable. Main lake temperatures often go higher than 75 degrees, with much higher temperatures in shallow water. Relatively stable patterns form, with groups of bass in shallow water, the flats, and in deeper water. During the summer period, the cover on sunken islands really starts to draw bass. The bass are now at their widest degree of dispersal throughout the lake. All good things must come to an end. These three periods, post-summer, turnover, and cold water, cause the lake to go through a lot of changes as it cools down from the warmth of summer to the sleepy cold of winter. Good cover becomes a sparse commodity. If you find green weeds, you'll probably find bass. The cold water period is probably the best time all year for trophy-sized fish, and a bass are more concentrated now than they'll ever be. Post-summer begins when cold nights start to cool the lake down. After a cool night, the tips of weeds on the flats will be black and dead. Cover in the shallow water is starting to turn brown and die. During the post-summer period, the main lake cools down to about 65 degrees. Shallow water temperatures fluctuate as the weather flip-flops from cold to hot. Groups of bass start moving from the deeper water and the flats into the shallow weeds. Bass remain in the flats and deep weeds, but during this period, there is a pronounced shift to shallow cover. Post-summer is often the best time of the whole year to fish the shallow water junk weeds. During turnover, plants in the main body of the lake turn brown and start to die off and decay. Main lake water temperature declines from 65 to 55 degrees. In addition to the sharp temperature drop, which affects the bass adversely, a tremendous mixing occurs in which water below the thermocline layer mixes with upper layers, creating an unstable, unhospitable environment for all life in the lake. The most apparent sign of the turnover period is an almost absolute cessation of fish activity. But the fishing action picks up again during the cold water period. Cold water covers main lake water temperatures from 55 to 35 degrees. As the cover in shallow water and the flats continues to die off, the bass move to deeper water. During the mid and later parts of this period, almost all the action is focused on the outer fringes of the flats and in deep water locations, where there are remnants of green cover. In some lakes, the water gets cold enough to actually freeze over. Now, there's bass caught through the ice, but it is an uncommon occurrence, and we're not going to cover it in this Mastery Series. Hey, there's something I want you to consider about the calendar. Use it as a guide to understand what the fish are doing in their environment. It's a learning aid, a teaching tool. It's not dogmatic. It's not a hard, fast rule. Use it to open your eyes, not close your mind. In this chapter, we've shown you how a natural lake changes from season to season and how those changes affect the location factor for bass. The calendar of fish activity describes the annual cycle of movement that bass follow. It gives you a tool for observing a lake and finding the best locations at any time of year. In this chapter, Al will show you the basic principle of the edge factor. The edge factor helps you find the bass in a general location, which helps you fish for them more efficiently. Bass relate to edges. That's an important principle, and it's one that almost every bass angler is aware of. But why are edges important? What are the best kind of edges, and how do you find them? Edges are important because bass are basically an ambush-type predator. Their muscles and body makeup dictate short spurts of speed to run down their food. To thrive, bass need a good amount of cover to use as ambush points. In other words, an edge. In natural lakes, the bait fish and other aquatic animals that bass feed on tend to spend most of their time relating to edges because that's where their food is, too. For the angler, edges are signposts that say, hey, fish here. Finding the right kinds of edges is the key to fishing successfully for bass. Let's take a look at the lake environment to understand what these edges are. Then we'll go out on a lake and see how to find them. We'll look at the summer period, when bass use many locations in different parts of the lake. 
summer, with its peak growth of cover, offers the greatest variety of locations and edges for bass. In deeper water, bass are using the clumps of weeds that grow in the low available light. Drop-offs and rocks are also the something different in the environment that attracts and holds bass. Along with the clumps of weeds, they create multiple edges, the edge on an edge factor that makes this spot even more attractive to bass. The weed cover on the flats creates all kinds of edges that active bass use. Clumps and open areas in the weeds create more edges on edges for the bass. Other objects can make the flats more attractive. Rocks, tree stumps, old tires, anything that creates a physical edge the bass can relate to. Physical edges like weeds, rocks, the bottom, logs, hey, these are all obvious edges. But there is another edge that isn't that obvious. It's shade. Hey, once and for all, bass don't go hide in the shade because they don't have eyelids and they want to get out of the rays of the sun. They use shade like any other edge. It's an ambush point that they can relate to. The shade edge is most important in the shallow water, where light levels are higher. One of the most obvious types of shade edge is that created by a dock. On a sunny day, bass will often lurk in the shadows of a dock, ready to strike at something inside or just barely outside of the shade edge. Lily pads create the same kind of overhead cover and shade edges. In low light conditions, like early or late in the day or on cloudy days, the shade edge is not as sharp. Rather than sticking to or being confined by shade edges, the bass actively cruise around in the shallow water. The shade edge is also important on flats and points. On clear days, when the sun shines into a weed line, the shade edge is actually inside the weed line. The bass are less active, and they are much less likely to venture out of the weeds to pursue prey or lures. On the shady side of a point or weed line, the shade edge is outside the weed line. The bass are more active, patrolling the water outside the weeds in search of prey and lures. This condition also occurs when overall light levels are low, early and late, and cloudy days. A lake map like this is a good place to get your bearings. You know, there's a 15-foot spot over here, a major point here, another one here, a five-foot hump over here. But most of the contours on most lake maps is usually too large to show the areas you should be fishing. You gotta be out there looking for them. In shallow water, it's relatively easy to look for and find the right kinds of edges. In a pre-spawn period, when bass are just starting to use shallow water, you look for edges, like these lily pad roots floating in the water. Little shoreline pockets like these are the something different that can attract and hold bass. In shallow water, it's easy to see sunken objects that serve as an edge for bass. This is where polarized sunglasses make all the difference to help you see a little better below the surface. As the weeds come up in shallow water, you look for pockets, open areas, and thick overhead cover. Boat docks are an obvious source of shade edges. In reed beds, the clumps and walls of thicker reeds become the edges. Often, the border between two different types of cover becomes a good edge to fish. As you move out to deeper water, seeing the edges directly becomes a little tougher. Depending on water clarity, you may be able to look for things like pockets and weeds on the flats. Below a certain depth, the depth finder must become your eyes. Here, any sudden change in a reading indicates an edge that should be investigated. Notice how the flasher reading quickly changes as we come up out of deep water and onto the mats of weeds near the drop-off. It changes again as we hit the weed line and get onto the flats. In deeper water, the lure itself helps you find the edge. As you fish it through the water, you concentrate on your sense of touch. You can feel the lure swimming through open water, hitting clumps of cover, and then resting on the bottom. We just showed you a lot of the common edges that exist in a natural lake. Obviously, there's other kinds of edges, too. The thing to remember is when you're fishing a boat dock, you fish the shaded side of the boat dock. When you're fishing weeds out on a flat, you're fishing holes in the weeds, the inside of the weed line, the outside of the weed line, hopefully the shaded side of the weed line. When you're fishing a drop-off, you're fishing a drop-off that has weeds on it an area that creates an edge that attracts the active bass. 
When you learn the principles of edge fishing, you'll find a lot of different kinds of edges on the lakes that you fish, and you're going to find fish on them. In this chapter, we've given you the basic principle of the edge factor and some common examples in natural lakes. The key edges that are most easily found and fished are shade edges, physical edges created by plants, rocks, and other objects, and sharp breaks in the bottom contour of the lake itself. We've completed our look at the location factor. In the next chapter, we look at the behavior of bass in these locations. In this chapter, Al will describe the most important basic principle of bass behavior. The strike zone of a bass determines what you must do to catch it. No doubt about it, bass are fascinating creatures. You could easily spend a lifetime studying bass and their different behaviors. But as anglers, we're mainly concerned with one type of behavior, why bass strike lures, and how we can get them to do it more often. You know, there's a lot of theories why a bass hits lures. Anger, hunger, curiosity, size, color, action, the list goes on and on. But we gotta be careful. Bass don't think or feel like we do. They simply react. They do what they have to do. Our experiences out on a lake can tell us a lot about bass striking lures. Some days the bass seem to hit just about anything. They're aggressive. They chase after fast moving lures and they hit hard. Other days the bass are just turned off. It seems like you need to drop a lure right on their nose to get a strike. We can take observations like these and turn them into a clear, simple theory about bass behavior. One that helps us develop a strategy for catching bass consistently. That theory is called the strike zone concept. It's really a simple idea. What it amounts to is there's an area around the bass that if you make the right presentations with the right lure, he's going to hit it. Now the size of that area is determined by the fish's activity. When they're aggressive, active, that strike zone is pretty big. Fishing's easy. When they're not aggressive, inactive, that strike zone is real restricted. Fishing's tough. It's just that simple. What determines the size and shape of this strike zone? Bass are basically short-range ambushers, not chasers. I've seen bass come from 20 feet away to strike a lure in shallow water. But for most bass, most of the time, the strike zone is a lot smaller than that. Bass are primarily visual feeders. So water clarity and light levels determine the size of the strike zone. Stability affects the strike zone. The more stable the environment, the larger the strike zone will tend to be. It usually takes about three days of stable conditions for the bite to reach its maximum potential. Any kind of instability, like cold fronts, causes strike zones to decrease, making the fishing a lot harder. The strike zone is a picture in your mind, a picture of the locations and the conditions that you're faced with. It gives you confidence and it helps you make the right presentations. You know, I learned a long time ago not to think too much about why a bass hits a lure or doesn't hit a lure. Oh yeah, it's fun to talk about it and there's a lot of theories on it, but there's really not a lot of scientific fact to back them up. However, I do know under certain conditions, the bass are active, the strike zone's big, fishing's easy. Under other conditions, bass are inactive, the strike zone is small, fishing's tough. With this kind of knowledge, I can make the right kind of presentations. How? That's what we're going to talk about in this next chapter. In this chapter, we've shown you the strike zone concept. The strike zone is the area in which a bass is most likely to strike a lure. Under some conditions, it is large, making it easier to find and catch the bass. Under other conditions, it is small, making it harder to find and catch bass. The strike zone adds to your mental image of what's happening beneath the surface of the lake, helping you fish with greater confidence and success. In this chapter, Al will describe his basic strategy for bass fishing, finding the most active bass in the most efficient way possible. Boy, I'll tell you what, this is one good looking flat. It's got everything you need. Big tufts of weeds growing all over the place. They're forming little pockets and edges, things that bass love to relate to. The question is, what part of the flats have the bass on it? Are they scattered all over the flat, or are they in a given area of the flat? To find this out, we choose the lures that we can fish fast and somewhat efficient. The object is to cover a lot of water quick. You're looking for the most aggressive fish on this given area. 
Now, this is where the strike zone concepts really come into play. Let's assume that the fish have been active. That means that that strike zone is big. The fish are aggressive, the run down most horizontal baits. And that's the key thing to remember, horizontal baits. Baits like this spinner bait, or let's say a crankbait. I could take this crankbait, and if I get it within this strike zone, the odds are this bass will run it down, and I'm gonna catch a fish. Now let's assume a cold front comes through, something that causes a negative effect. That bass's strike zone is gonna get smaller. If I crank this bait out here like this, he's not gonna chase it down. It calls for a change in presentation. You need a slower moving bait, something that's fished vertical, like a slip rig plastic worm, or a jig and eel, or a jig worm. The bass will not chase a far out bait. He's kind of restricted in a key area. That strike zone is very, very small. This vertical presentation has to fall right in front of him. It's almost got to hit him on the nose to get a triggering response out of him. Well, there's no doubt about it. A slip rig worm sure works, especially for unaggressive fish. You have to fish it slow and deliberate. You can't fish a lot of water fast with it. It's normally not my first choice. Whenever possible, I'll pick a horizontal presentation, like a crankbait or a spinnerbait. I'm always looking for the most aggressive fish first. If I catch a fish this way, it's a good bet I'll get two or three more fish in that area. If I don't, I have two choices. I can either move to another location and concentrate on a more active fish, or I can go to a slower presentation, like a worm, and fish the unaggressive fish in the same area. Right now, let's take these two options and go out on the water for a few minutes. Okay, here's that flat I was on at the beginning of the chapter. To illustrate the strategy, I start out by trying to find any active bass on a flat. I cast my fast-moving lure, in this case a spinnerbait, to the edges where the active bass are most likely to be, the outside edge and over pockets on a flat. If there are any active bass in this location, my presentation will quickly find them. If I make contact and catch one, I'll stay on this location with the fast-moving lure until I've caught and released as many active bass as I can find. But if all the bass in this flat have small strike zones, my fast-moving presentation probably won't provoke any strikes. Then I know that I have eliminated this as unproductive water. Or I can choose to work the flat with a slower presentation, like a worm, and hope that I can drop it right in front of one of those inactive bass. This strategy is searching for the active bass very slightly from period to period. For example, in a pre-spawn period, when bass are roving the shallow water and there's little cover for them to relate to, you need to fan cast an area to search for any active bass. During post-spawn, when the cover's emerging, you still search with a fast-moving lure like this moss boss, which is one of the fastest ways I know of checking shallow water pads for active fish. Now, during the summer periods, edges become well-defined, so bass stick close to them. You still search with a fast-moving lure, but your search is much more focused. Here I'm moving down a weed line with a crankbait looking for active bass. When cold water really slows down the bass's metabolism in a fall period, strike zones tend to be pretty small. Fast-moving search-type presentations are not productive. But in the late fall, bass tend to be bunched together. So once you find a group, you don't have to search far for more. To make this search strategy pay off, you can't rely on any one presentation in one location. You've got to be able to recognize the high percentage areas and pick the best choice of lures for that given condition. Now that you got the fundamentals of location, seasonal movements, edges, strike zones, search strategies, you're ready for the last part of the puzzle. That's choosing the right lures. In this chapter, we've shown you the basic principle of using your lure to search for the most active bass in a location, a strategy that can build your versatility as an angler and help you get more fish more consistently. In this chapter, Al will describe one of the basic principles of presentation, selecting the right lure to match the location and behavior of the bass. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of lures that catch bass. That's the good news. The bad news is this vast variety of lures, sizes, colors, shapes, scare off a lot of fishermen. Most bass fishermen only know how to use one or two of these baits in one or two conditions. In actuality, the key to fishing success is versatility. Choosing a right lure for the right conditions really isn't that hard. 
Basically, the lure is your invitation to the fish, an invitation to dinner. Hey, how do you make that invitation work? First, you pick a lure that'll definitely get into where the fish is living, the particular area you're fishing. Secondly, you want a lure that'll attract the fish, it'll appeal to his senses. Third, you want a lure that is fast, can be fished fast, and is still efficient. To pick a lure, you got to ask yourself three questions. Am I fishing deep water or shallow water? Am I fishing in cover or out and around cover? How fast can I fish this particular lure and still keep it in a fish's strike zone? These three major characteristics make the difference between using a right lure or the wrong lure in the conditions you're faced with. There's other characteristics that I call fine-tuning features, those little things that make big differences, things like size. Generally speaking, big spinner baits like this work better in dark, dirty water environments. Smaller spinner baits like this are more effective in clear water. Again, the rule of thumb is the bigger the bait, the bigger the bass. That's considering the fact that there's big bass in the area that you're fishing. Then comes color. Multicolors and fluorescence, like these two baits, tend to produce more strikes in dark, dirty water environments. In clear water, soft, more subtle colors, like yellow, white, black, seem to get you more hits. What about sound or vibration? Lures that make a lot of noise, like this, put out a lot of vibration, are real productive in dark water environments. They're nowhere near as effective in clear water conditions. Last but not least is scent. Now, scent won't attract fish to your lure. If you're fishing the right lure in a right location, and there's a school of bass there, you're going to get a few more hits from them. It's a triggering effect. That's what we call fine-tuning. I've shown you the process for selecting the right lures. To make this process work effectively, you have to understand some basic facts about lures. To make this a little bit simpler, I took each category and put them in groups. Hard baits or crankbaits? Spinner baits, jigs, topwater baits, soft plastics, and what I call specialty baits. Let's start off with the spinner bait. It's the most effective bass lure there is. You can catch bass on a spinner bait all year long. You can fish it in deep water. You can fish it in shallow water. You can fish it in trees, reeds, lily pads. It's that versatile of a bait. Basically, the spinner bait falls into two categories. What's termed a tandem spin, meaning two blades in a row. You fish a tandem spin usually in five feet of water or less. When you're fishing a horizontal approach, you're fishing the most active fish. The other category is the single spin, simply meaning one blade. Now, a single spin can be fished in 5, 10, 15, 20 feet of water. It helicopters like this and falls down a drop off. You fish it in a pumping action. It's a little more versatile than a tandem spin. It's for those less aggressive fish. Remember the importance of the vertical presentations for the least aggressive fish, the horizontal presentations for the more aggressive fish. The next family of baits is the hard bait, or what's referred to as a crankbait. Obviously, it's not as versatile as the spinner bait. With these exposed hooks, you'd have a hard time fishing this in reeds or lily pads. It's used mostly in open water situations. Now, you can experiment with sizes and colors, but your most important concern with a crankbait is that it's running true. If it's running from one side or the other, tune it so it runs true. Soft plastics can be fished anywhere depending on how you rig them. You can put them on an exposed jig head like this for open water, or you can rig them weedless like this if you're in heavy cover. They come in a variety of colors, shapes, sizes. Generally speaking, a flat tail worm like this works best when you're dragging the worm on a bottom. If you're swimming a worm, hopping it, fishing fairly fast, you want to use a curly tail. Jigs like this work best in cool water and vertical presentations especially if you want to get down in deep water. A combination like this with a soft piece of plastic on the back or some pork rind is especially effective on big bass. There's something magic about it. Poppers, propeller baits, buzz baits, topwater fishing. 
Hey, I don't think there's any question about it. When you're catching bass on the surface, it's one of the most exciting fishing experiences you can ever have. But the fact of the matter is, topwater fishing is rarely as effective as these other families of baits are. But when they're hitting the surface, it's terrific. These are our specialty lures. They're designed to be fished in shallow water with heavy cover, areas you just can't get to with these other baits. You can see there's a lot of lures that catch bass. Other factors come into play. Things like color, size, sound, vibration, scent. Oh, these are important things, and they have to be covered when you're choosing lures. But it's not a subject we're going to talk about in this particular mastery series. Hey, I want to bring a point across. I could pick two lures out of each one of these six categories and be catching as many as 80% of the fish that I'm catching now. It's a fact. You know why? Because the real keys to fishing success is understanding the location, fish behavior, and the basic principles of presentation. Hey, I'm not telling you to clean out your tackle box. After all, part of the fun of fishing is experimenting with different lures. But to really learn bass fishing, don't let all these lures be a distraction. Hey, changing lures doesn't always change your luck. To be successful, concentrate on the basic principles of location, fish behavior, and presentation. In this chapter, Al has shown you a simple step-by-step -step process for selecting the right lure in a given location. The process consists of knowing the basic characteristics of a lure, then matching lures to the conditions you face. In this chapter, Al will describe the basic principles of selecting the right rods and reels and electronic equipment for bass fishing in natural lakes. The right equipment is always important. For bass in natural lakes, you really don't need a lot. I normally fish five rod and reel combinations, but two of the most important ones would be a good free spool bait casting reel, like this, on a medium action graphite rod. This would be used with 12, 14, or 17 pound test line. In most cases, 14 is what you need. In a good open faced spinning rod and reel combination. Big mistake a lot of people make with spinning rods is they get a buggy whip rod. You don't want that. You want something that is stiff, stout, that you could set a hook with, particularly in worm fishing or jig and eel fishing. A smaller capacity reel like this, five and a half foot, something that you'd be fishing normally with 10 or 12 pound test line, usually 10. The other three combinations that I would carry in almost all situations would be a six foot spinning rod, heavy action, 12 pound test line. This is if I gotta go to heavier worms, heavier weight jigs, and I'm fishing a little bit deeper, a little heavier in cover, and I got to really put some meat behind that line to get the fish out of it. A six-foot bait casting rod, 17-pound test line. This is if I'm changing like crankbaits, as an example. On a medium-action bait casting rod, I'd be throwing a smaller crankbait. It works fine. But if I put a real big crankbait on with a real deep dive and lip, I'd go to that six-footer. It doesn't tire your wrists or your arms as quick. You just fish easier, more effectively, more efficiently. Then a flip and stick with 20 pound test line to go after those real big bass that live in real shallow, heavy cover. Again, you can reef up on that fish and get it out of the cover without breaking your line. Remember, all rods and reels are, are tools, tools to help you do a job with. Hey, you know, there's a lot of electronical aids on the market to help us catch more bass but there's two that we really need for largemouth bass in natural lakes. Number one is the flasher. In this case, I'm showing you a 30-foot scale. The reason I want to stress the 30-footer is your definition is much clearer. It's much more precise, and rarely are you going to be catching bass much deeper than 20, 25 foot of water in a natural lake. Then you need a surface temperature gauge. You want to know what the temperature is early in a year as it starts to warm, and again, late in the year as it starts to cool. Surface temperature only. As far as temp goes in the summertime in largemouth bass, it's really no big deal. Hey, don't get distracted by all the electronical aids that are available. Learn to use your flasher and your temperature gauge, and you're going to start to catch plenty of fish. In this chapter, Al has given you some basic guidelines for selecting a variety of rods, reels, and electronic equipment. Because products in this sport are changing so rapidly, we recommend contacting the manufacturers listed in the guidebook for information on their latest products. In this program, we've given you the foundation and knowledge that you need to have to have more fun and success out bass fishing on the water. In the next three programs of this mastery series, we're going to show you how to apply this knowledge to conditions that exist in spring, in summer, and in fall.
Hey, thanks for watching this program. And to get more out of it, use it along with your guidebook. Hey, most of all, go out fishing and have fun.